Um, today I have the honor of introducing Shalini Gupta. Shalini is a writer, researcher, and environmental justice advocate uh, activist who has been involved with energy, climate, and environmental policy with a focus on building frontline community capacity for the past 20 years. Her work is centered on solutions to our ecological crises that are grounded in people and place and our economic and social histories. Through consultancy work, Shalini works with a range of philanthropic, governmental, and community-based organizations across the country. And as a former governor appointee to the Minnesota Next Generation Energy Board, Shalini has served as co-chair of the Headwaters Foundation for Justice Board of Directors and on the founding leadership team of the Midwest Environmental Justice Network. Prior to starting her consulting work, Shalini was the co-founder and executive director of the Center for Earth, Energy and Democracy, uh, which is an environmental justice research and policy organization. As a co-facilitator of the City of Minneapolis Environmental Justice Working Group, her work helped develop the city's groundbreaking 2013 Climate Action Plan, which established Minneapolis's first environmental justice-focused Green Zones initiative. Uh, Shalini holds a BA in Geophysical Sciences from the University of Chicago and a Master's in Environmental Management from Yale University. She lives in Minneapolis, home of the Dakota people, with her husband, two sons, mother, and a community of friends and extended family. And for those interested in learning more about her work, I'll put a link to uh, her website in the chat. Um, today, Shalini will be speaking about the role of a justice lens in the future of environmental policy and research, uh, with, I think, some specific thoughts on the imperative for Minnesota and the Twin Cities moving forward. Uh, so with that, Shalini, I'll turn it over to you, and thank you so much for being here today. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Kelly. Hi, everybody. Great to be here. Um, just for a warning, uh, my kids um, are, have their piano class. So in the background, you might hear um, a few keys going. Um, well, it's really great to be here with you all. So um, yeah, I'm just gonna start with telling you a little bit about my myself and kind of my journey from, um, from sort of the geophysical sciences into being an EJ activist and, um, and then going deeper into the green zone and some of the federal policy EJ like landscape that's, um, that's kind of before us now. Um, so I'm currently in <clears throat> so I'm currently in Minneapolis. I live in South Minneapolis, about a mile and a half from George Floyd Square. Um, and so the trials kind of weighing heavily um, in the area I live. Um, I moved back to Minnesota um, after um, grad school and undergrad. Um, I grew up in the western suburbs here. Um, was born in India, um, but came here uh, to Minnesota as, as a young child. Um, so you know I when. I did my undergraduate in the geophysical sciences and then just when like a lot of the environmental studies departments were even just starting out as I'm sure as many of you know. Um, and there wasn't really, um, I started making a transition to environmental studies and when I was in graduate school, there was an integration happening with more of the physical sciences in terms of um, uh, in terms of like biology and chemistry, et cetera, but not, it was really obvious when I was there, even at Yale, um, that there wasn't as much of analysis and work happening with the social sciences. Um, so there wasn't an analysis necessarily of, on race, socioeconomic considerations, or really how like American history intersected with the land and resources that, um, that we were studying. And my, that graduate program I was in um, was great in many aspects. Um, I had to say though, in my in my work and sort of um, uh, sort of transitions into really focusing on the communities that were most impacted by a lot of environmental issues, I felt um, there was a lot of uh, relearning that had to happen. So um, in terms of the codification, um, in terms of thinking about natural resources and market-based mechanisms that were sort of um, being grounded and founded when I was in graduate school and where a lot of a lot of the work and orientation was moving towards in terms of climate um, as well as um, sort of other um, areas. 
So um, I went and worked in Germany for a little while for an economics um, institution there, the World Institute um, on Economy and World Economy, um, and then came back home um, here to Minnesota and started working in the nonprofit sector, uh, largely on energy and climate issues. So um, I worked a lot during the 2000, like 2008 large state pushes on the greenhouse gas bills, sort of the seminal greenhouse gas bills and the renewable electricity standard that was being set then. Um, at that time, there was uh, most of the organizations working on environmental policy at the state level were uh, predominantly white institutions. And I kind of found myself leading a double, sort of double professional life. So during the day um, working at these um, uh, environmental organizations doing some great work in terms of, and, and sort of, I was able to use my analytical skills. I did a lot of the energy rate impacts of wind energy um, and sort of looking at sort of the economic impacts of a lot of the, the bills that were being passed. That said, um, and then at, uh, but outside of that, um, sort of my other job was working on environmental justice issues. There was a lot of um, the narrative a lot at that time was that communities of color, immigrant communities didn't care about climate change. Sort of the standard assumption was in, in mainstream environmental policy that in terms of the development curve, people only start caring about things that um, in terms of environmentalism after you reach a certain development economic class and then after that you start caring about um, uh, open spaces and um, preservation of uh, natural resources, which I'm sure you're all familiar with um, that sort of um, narrative that exists. Um, the, uh, it was very counter to a lot of the experiences and the other research at the University of Michigan that was coming out, which had a very strong EJ uh, sort of analysis lens in terms of their graduate program, uh, that communities of color were actually the most interested in environmental issues because one, they were the most impacted by a lot of the pollution issues, the fossil fuel industry, um, which was the creator of climate change um, in terms of where facilities, mining, um, uh, refineries were located. Um, and so it was counter to, um, I think some of the emerging research that was codifying that and a lot of the world the alternative sort of worldviews on how um, environmentalism was kind of being framed at the time. So um, one of the um, early, I mean, there's been EJ organizing in the state for a long time, uh, but uh, environmental justice advocates of Minnesota where Keith Ellison um, sort of helped found. So I was on the board of that um, and it was, it was starting to sort of elevate the conversation of environmental justice to, um, to the state level. Um, and then it's sort of the experience though of bridging these two worlds for such a long time, there was like a cognitive dissonance. Um, it was very clear that a lot of communities of color that were on the front lines of much of, were gonna be on the front lines of climate change back then, who are now on the front lines of climate change 15 years later, um, and of fossil fuel transportation the air pollution, soil pollution, um, they did not have access to research and analysis that came from an orientation or a justice lens. And so a lot of the research that um, communities of color had to rely on just due to capacity issues, because another part of my work is with philanthropy, huge disparities in terms of funding of advocacy groups and EJ advocacy groups, um, community of color um, led advocacy groups um, they just didn't have the capacity and um, resources to, to develop the research agendas that they needed in terms of looking at the issues they cared about in terms of that intersectionality around um, sort of standard environmental issues um, and the socioeconomic, the race class intersection and how do you structure policies. Um, so just as an example, right, on climate, the big sectors we talk about are the energy sector, um, so electricity, heating, um, housing, transportation, and those are basic needs, basic necessities, and um, 
and deeply impact how people move around where they live. And there's huge injustices in, in housing, inequities in housing due to, due to history <laughs> in terms of redlining. And um, you know, same with transportation, um, the highway, highway 94 is sort of citing um, through the Rondo neighborhood. All these infrastructure that are highly fossil fuel intensive um, have a history that is racial in and class in some way um but that wasn't and so the solutions being proposed because that race and class analysis wasn't part of climate policy um at the time the solutions being proposed were very technologically heavy um and not necessarily taking into consideration that the inequities they had created so we're actually reinforcing solutions we're going to reinforce those same equities by ignoring them so in order to give communities of color um, that were most impact a little bit more grounding on that research, um, I helped co-found the Center for Earth Energy and Democracy, which was really focused on that. Um, and so um, that was sort of our intention to help provide that support and help elevate the policy research needs of environmental justice communities here in the region in the Midwest, but also nationally, because there was such a need. So um, it was really through that work once that started getting established um, where the intersections with a lot of the, the green zones work happened in Minneapolis. And so um, I don't know how familiar you all are with the green zones in Minneapolis, but I'm just gonna share my screen. Just one second. Okay, can you? See it? Yes? Yes, I can okay. see it. Great. So, um, so the green zones came out of the 2013 Minneapolis Climate Action Plan, which just to give you a little background on that, um, that was the Sustainability Office of the City of Minneapolis had convened over a hundred different partners on various working groups around utilities, transportation, housing, waste from the standard areas. Um, and there wasn't one person of color in the entire, um, in the entire space. Um, this is in a city that's almost half people of color. And so um, I, along with other EJ leaders, really pushed to um, have an environmental justice working group established it was late in the process. So the EJ working group um, was um, did an evaluation um, of all the sector sort of standard policies that were in that climate action plan and then added some. So the Minneapolis Climate Action Plan had um, without until the EJ working group was um, put in place, um, there was no public transit in there. There was not. Um, because the indicators being used were all around VMT, vehicle miles traveled. There was nothing around renters because it was mostly on homeowners. So the, and there was nothing uh, about um, the waste incinerator park, which is near downtown Minneapolis. All those pieces that now that, you know, we're in kind of a new era of climate policy, you know, seem, of course, um, the frameworks back then did not account for those, um, uh, for those issues that related to nearly half the population of the city. And co-pollutants were not part of it as well in terms of thinking about, um, uh, it was a very myopic, as many of you know that work on climate, uh, focused on greenhouse gas emissions um, and counting and not, and it was the EJ working group insisted that co-pollutants such as particulate matter uh, be included in ongoing reporting by the city around that. Another key initiative that was put in was the green zones. Um, and this was based on the um, California efforts, environmental justice efforts that have established green zones across the state of California, specifically the LA um, green zones um, effort, which was really transformative in thinking about a place-based approach and how do you put that into, um, into city policy. 
in LA, they have a much stronger zoning sort of orientation to it in terms of an overlay and zoning. In Minneapolis, it is an initiative. So um, you have North Minneapolis area, parts of Northeast really around the industrial corridors. So I don't know if many of you are familiar with this area, but you have Highway 94 coupled with um, an industrial corridor right here, um, an I-3 corridor. And, um, and a largely low income um, community of color. The south side green zones, um, similarly, you have um, it bound, the boundaries are 35W, 94, 55, and um, an I3 zoned <clears throat> industrial corridor with um, heavy manufacturing facilities located um, and sometimes in very close proximity across the street of residential property. So, um, and, and families of color. So, um, so this, these were the two areas that were eventually established due to a lot of um, activism and pushing and strategic work by the EJ community. I would say back then the Office of Sustainability was on a learning curve in terms of how to start even integrating, um, uh, thinking about um, these issues. And the real orientation of green zones is around cumulative impacts. So thinking about multiple pollution sources um, uh, and how to start to codify that into um, city and state policy and building off of previous state legislation on the south side that looked at, th that looked at cumulative pollution. So there is no city ordinance though. So the initiative is just that, an initiative. So that is a next big push by EJ communities to try and actually um, um, require um, some action um, in these areas. But what the initiative does is basically says these areas have cumulative pollution issues and um, in highly vulnerable neighborhoods. And so how, what actions are being taken to reduce that pollution burden while um, also ensuring that the benefits of the green economy are also being targeted here. Because the research was also showing that a lot of the benefits of the green economy were going to ready, sort of ready communities um, in terms of efficiency and retrofits that were wealthier. So um, really quick. Um, so we started out with I'm just gonna go through these pretty fast. <laughs> I'm covering a lot, so we can do a lot in Q&A, but um, so really grounding the process in terms of the South Side. Um, part of my work two years ago, along with Alejandra Tobara Latriz, was to get more concrete in terms of a South Side Green Zones work plan. This was a community-based effort um, and we were facilitating it. I was the policy sort of um, guide, facilitator through it. And um, Alejandra uh, was the a relationship oriented facilitator in terms of the community residents that were there. And so we really grounded it um, in terms of the EJ history of the South Side um, and the people that are present there. Um, just to acknowledge that even though this became a city program, um, well, it was written into policy in 2013, but actually, um, they had five years to implement it and the city waited until year five <laughs> to do it, to even start planning it. So um, to acknowledge that environmental justice organizing has been happening for hundreds of years in the community, even before the city finally established the green zone. So that was really to sort of right away honor the community's ongoing work and that even though we were coming in, um, our orientation as facilitators were, it was not sort of the city sweeping in to say, okay, you know, this is our program to do this because there is a tendency for that to happen. And so this was really to ground that in the community experience. Um, there was a long um, process uh, for two years before um, Alejandra and I, entered this with Hope Community um, and LSP and some other nonprofits that did a lot of work to garner what the community identified as the key problems. 
that's where we really grounded this process to center it on the community identified problems um, to get more concrete on the work plan. Um, and so what these are the ones, I mean, you see the traditional ones around land use, air and soil, um, healthy food access, health and energy and housing, which really had, you can see the focus on health was really running through, of course. Key ones were around green economy and anti-displacement and self-determination and accountability. So I'll get more into that, but um, working groups were essentially established that had community residents and expertise as part of that, that sort of held, um, held us down. And we started, we sort of grounded in how the community identified what the problems were. So um, what we um, were really trying to do was flip on how um, policy making happened um, in terms of usually it's a city sort of dictated um, initiative that then they want engagement from the community to give input. This instead put the community at the center, not the city, and then looked at how um, the other levels of expertise could be in service to the community concerns. So it was the orientation of tech, like the technical assistance, the research assistance, the policy expertise was always in service to the community concerns. And so, um, and, and putting the community expertise at the, same, um, at the same level as the other levels of expertise. Um, and so at every, we had a phase where after the community was identified what their um, specific um, concerns were and possible policy solutions, we took it to research and policy experts, ex, um, experts to um, give their sense. So for example, in housing, uh, we had Elizabeth Glidden, who was the former uh, vice president of the city council and now is at the Minnesota Housing Partnership um, to provide sort of insights in terms of housing policy, but it was always then brought back to the community working group to see, okay, does this still make sense for you? So at every turn, they were in control. Um, and then we also took it to the city after that. So in turn, we took it to regulatory, public works, um, sustainability, um, uh, CPED, uh, and then had them give input in terms of how, in terms of feasibility or barriers. So the residents also could start to learn who in the city, because the city was this sort of monolith, you know, like just in terms of who exactly could be some allies within the city and sort of help um, also identify how quickly certain certain parts could move. So, but the orientation was always to keep the community at the decision-making table. I mean, at, at the center of it. So um, I just wanted to share this slide because, you know, in terms of um, sort of traditional air, soil, food and um, energy slash housing issues, they were really grounded in the self-determination and accountability piece. Um, that was the first section in the work plan, um, which I can send a link to Kelly after if you are interested in reading more about the process and the sort of very substantial set of policies that came out of this. Um, but the, um, that was really around acknowledging that even if you fixed the air and soil, food access and health and energy and housing, the community really needed to have who was deciding? A key element of justice was who, of the environmental justice piece, was who had the power to decide what was happening to them in terms of self-determination. And so that was a critical, that's a critical point. And then in terms of green economy and anti-displacement, the concern was that a lot of these traditional environmental issues, um, yellow, green, and blue here, um, resulted in gentrification. And so it, these were secondary to green economy and anti-displacement and self-determination accountability because those are really the justice pieces that um, so that the community can control and stay in place um, as they dealt with these um, traditional um, sort of issues that 
very much impacted their family's health. Um, this is my last slide and then I'll go back into um, stop share. But so, you know, the, the I wanted to share this. So this is the signing of um, the first environmentalist executive order um, during the Clinton administration. And this was in the 1990s and um, it, you know, had minimal teeth, but, you know, there's a lot of work now happening. Um, I think there's a huge sea change in terms of the EJ work we're gonna see in the federal government coming up in the next few years. Um, that said, I just wanna point this out. There's a lot of um, uh, EJ activists around here, but you'll notice the, besides the president and vice president, the other white male here is Paul Wellstone, um, our former Senator from Minnesota. And just to show that the leadership um, from our state and then activists here from Chicago and, and the Midwest um, has been present on these issues. And um, it's ebbed and flowed, but I think there's, um, there has been um, an analysis and a real support on EJ issues that um, hopefully we'll be seeing again um, shortly. So I just like to share that picture with um, people I speak to in Minnesota. Um, so yeah, and you know, there's a lot happening. I'll just quickly just talk about um, the federal landscape right now and then kind of wrap up for Q and A. Um, Cause I've kind of thrown a lot out at you all, but um, so what's really exciting on the federal landscape, there is, I'm gonna get my notes up. There's a lot happening. Um, so as you know, um, you know, you, we've had in terms of appointments, um, uh, a huge sea change in terms of um, the, the people of color, indigenous people that have been appointed, that comes with um, also a shift in, um, in the types of uh, policies. So it's all building on, um, again, long-term work in sort of the national EJ movement. Um, Obama had an EJ 2020 initiative, um, and now we're seeing a lot happen in terms of Biden's executive orders. Um, there's a uh, a directive justice 40 initiative on the infrastructure bill that focuses on EJ and communities of color in terms of his infrastructure spending. Um, there, um, there's an EJ mapping and data collection act of 2021 that is um, hopefully moving through um, that sort of building on EJ screen. Um, and then uh, they're doing some congressional review acts on some of the um, sort of really egregious pieces that the Trump administration left. Um, they had a horrible, as you know, environmental uh, record, um, and a lot of a lot of that disproportionately impacted communities of color because they lived next to these facilities that um, that they were bending or um, reducing the rules on. So I am just gonna kind of um, stop there. Um, I just want to say. Um, one thing in terms of, you know, coming back to Minnesota, um, the work that I oriented myself around is really around policy that honors knowledge and the expertise of communities on the front lines. Um, and a key issue is really around um, power. And um, I hear a lot this, um, this saying in the policy world that let's not sacrifice the perfect for the good. Um, because it gets complicated, especially on environmental policy. And what I find is that usually the gap between perfect and good is um, communities of color. Um, and so that gets sacrificed in a lot of environmental policy. Um, and so I think um, there's a lot that needs to shift in how we look at that policy in the state. It's, it's starting to happen. MPCA does have an EJ framework. Uh, uh, in place, but um, yeah, there's there's a lot that still needs to happen. Um, and I'm just, I was excited to also talk to you all because in terms of just, um, you know, maybe having a conversation about this too, in terms of your research, but also training the next generation um, of students of color um, to really start to diversify the types of issues and research support that a lot of these marginalized communities that have a legacy of pollution get and how 
you know, researchers are protected because we're taking many times taking on large corporations. Um, how that kind of manifests institutionally is interesting. And, um, you know, I, I'm also just interested <laughs> in how, um, how race, um, a racial justice lens, given where we are as well, um, integrates into soil, water, and climate. Because in my mind, um, you can't teach or talk about soil if, if your curriculum doesn't have something about race and you're dealing with soil, water, and climate, there's, it's, it's I would say, kind of is, is reinforcing a lot of the racial dynamics that exist because soil is about land, who gets to decide what gets put on it, soil contamination, um, a lot of pollution issues, um, generally in terms of air, soil, and, and climate, um, have in my mind a race history and so um i'm interested to hear also from you all um how um how that's being integrated into your departments um and the concept of power um in those in decision making and environmental policy and teaching your students so um i'm gonna stop there so um thanks again kelly for inviting me I'll take Q and A. Um, as I'll let you facilitate that, Kelly. All right. Thanks so much, Shalini. Um, typically, since we're not that big of a group, uh, we can either um, just unmute and and speak if folks are comfortable doing that, or I'll also um, be taking a look at the chat. And to start off, I'm just going to put. I forgot to put Shalini's website there. Um, if folks are interested in that. Um, but otherwise, I'll just open it up. Kelly, I got a question. Go ahead. Uh, Kelly, uh, you mentioned about race and the soil and water. Could you give an example of uh, how does the race come into science? Like, if you, but you know, you're teaching science or physics or chemistry. Could you give an example? How does uh, race comes into play in that? And I'll sure. It. Yeah, and I and I, you know, I I am not a, you know, practicing hard scientist anymore, even though that was ages ago in my undergraduate. So I, I hope you all actually delve into that question more. Um, the way I've seen it come up is one in terms of um, what gets what gets researched, who gets the, or, and what types of issues get funding. Um, for example, in terms of toxicity um, for soil, um, uh, you know, is there a, um, it, it was very difficult to get, um, at least where I've seen, and you know, there may, there may be spot cases, but in terms of focusing on um, sort of soil contamination in highly urbanized areas, what could that maybe mean for flood zones in terms of migration if a toxic site is, um, is flooded during a climatic event and then the migration of the toxicity into residential areas? That sort of level of even um, uh, looking at that air pollution in terms of the microclimate impacts with climate change, what does that mean? Um, for, I, I, for example, the most vulnerable like construction workers that are out in high transportation areas and air pollution um, in microclimates and high heat days, things like that. Like very, um, where we need more research being done on those things um, and it, it's starting to happen, um, but more needs to be done. Um, and then I would say in terms of how those questions then are getting framed by community residents and then translated into policies and programs that um, in a non-technical way, like partnerships with highly, because we need the highly technical aspects, but in a way that also is linked with popular education so that communities can, um, uh, help lead that, but also integrate it. And so they can advocate for changes 
Um, so those are just some examples. Um, the other place I'll, I'll also say, um, I've known in terms of some academics that are studying, um, there was an EJ science initiative that Union of Concerned Scientists, that might be a good place to actually look at um, in terms of some of their work and trying to bridge this divide. Um, a lot of young researchers of color that are coming out of a lot of frontline communities wanting to look at this are taking on Chevron, are taking on, for example, in, in Richmond, California, that's the refinery, are taking on very large um, financial interests. And um, many of them don't feel protected by their institutions in terms of the research because they don't have tenure. Um, and they're taking on some of these very complex issues that are that are sort of pushing the powers of at that that be. So those are just well, some examples, but I would love to hear you all talk about that as well at some point, you know? I think it's a really interesting conversation. There's a lot there. So when you, when you talk about race and education, you're really talking about race and research and not in the in the education part of in terms of lectures and taking classes and that kind of stuff? Well, I would say that it's also there. Um, when I went through, um, you know, my undergraduate and graduate program, um, and maybe that's changed now, but I would, as an EJ, this is my EJ le activist lens in terms of working on policy, I would have appreciated um, my hydrology course um, talking a little bit about water rights, right? I would have appreciated them talking about indigenous water rights or some history about ownership and why, why is it that market-based mechanisms are becoming, are, are sort of the dominant policy right now in terms of the history of, of funding in, those, in that space um, in terms, or the Flint water crisis. Um, so, which I know is a different system than hydrology, but still, um, I think there's there's definitely an aspect in terms of more quote traditional natural resource courses that you can't separate from ownership and who gets to decide what happens, especially when you're talking about environmental pollution, um, who owns it in terms of private property rights, um, just generally who gets to decide what happens, government regulation. Um, why it's looking at sort of the framework is the right to pollute. You know, I think those kinds of questions um, would have been very useful um, when I was taking those courses. But I think also as I see now and try to find researchers that can help communities, it's difficult. It's difficult to find researchers that can have some understanding of these issues that communities on the ground are facing. And I think it is important, especially um, as the university is, and you know, Humphrey School and others are generating um, our future government um, officials that are doing regulatory work. They need to have an understanding how it intersects with people, place, and power, these natural resource issues. Okay, thank you. Okay, so there's a question in the chat um, from Deb Allen saying, you mentioned that it's hard for EJ groups working with and represented by communities of color, um, that they had difficulty getting funding. Can you share a few organizations in Minnesota that you think are doing that work well? Sure, yeah. Um, so I think in terms of, I can't remember the exact statistics, a few years old now, but of all environmental funding, I think it was, it was like less than 5% went to organizations that were led by, by people of color. So it is a huge disparity and that is largely why you see um, more white organizations is national, so not just in Minnesota. Um, and so here in um, Minneapolis and in Minnesota, it is now, I think just very recently, I would say, um, so SEED, when I ran a nonprofit, uh, we were one of the few well-funded EJ organizations. Most of our funding was not from the state, like within the state in terms of philanthropy. It was, we had national funders on the coast that were funding us. 
And so it was only after a lot of advocacy, the EJ community has been doing, it's not only about public policy or like private corporation campaigns, it's also in philanthropy in terms of justice around funding. And so because EJ groups have been working in this realm of getting philanthropy to fund more and showing this disparity, because people, you know, there's always this thing, especially in advocacy, they're like, oh, well, they didn't show up. They didn't come. Well, why would people show up? There's, they don't, you know, they've got other jobs. They've got other things they're doing. And so, um, uh, so now you're seeing, and I think especially since George Floyd, um, there has been an awakening. It, we are in a movement moment. And um, so I think it's really all hands on deck. And so you're starting to see spaces, traditional philanthropy start to really question. So I work with the McKnight Foundation um, and they're really starting to think about how um, their climate funding, I work with their, um, a different program in there, but there's an integration in terms of how their climate funding and environmental funding starts to really think about um, uh, communities that are most impacted. Um, and what does that mean for the future, right? Do you have examples, though, of just groups that exist oh, right sure. now on the ground? Yeah. Because I, I, that's what I'm thinking is now is the moment. Yeah. And I think if they can get this message out, I think there are lots of people who would feel like they want to support those groups. Yeah. So there's, um, in Minnesota, so there's Copal, um, there's a C-O-P-A-L, Copal. Um, there's um, community members for environmental justice. Um, there's the Center for Earth Energy and Democracy. There's a North American Water Office. Um, there's, um, I can maybe think of a, there's a whole list. I can send some to Kelly. Yeah, that and, would be great. And share them with you, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, that sounds great. I'd be happy to pass that along. Um, I see that Amy shared a link in the chat. She says, for some background, this paper was recently shared via the URGE, which is Unlearning Racism in Geosciences Curriculum, um, Anatomy of Environmental Racism and the Environmental Justice Movement. Um, so that may have been some background related to sort of uh, uh, curriculum development that incorporates um, and EJ Lens. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm excited. I'm going to take a look at that. Thank you. Because, um, I mean, I did geo, I, I did geophysical sciences. It's been like 20, 25 years ago now. It's been a while. Um, but back then, there was no talk about land ownership or, um, you know, the issues I've been talking about. And so I'd be curious to see you know, how, how or if the programs have evolved or taking advantage of this moment. Um, and I feel the responsibility, honestly, coming from, um, coming from this world, the responsibility to really reflect um, on this. Hi there. Um, can you hear me okay? Thanks for the talk. I was just going to um, I guess I can give an example, you have sort of asked for different examples of teaching and so forth. And so I can give one example of one class that I co-teach um, is intro to the in, sort of intro in, introduction to environmental issues. So it's sort of a, it's a freshman level intro to environmental science class. Um, right now we have 270 students this semester. Um, and so and that's a class where we we're working to kind of incorporate environmental justice as a theme kind of throughout. And so kind of getting back to an earlier question about how does it relate to the chemistry and the physics? And I think the answer is it's it's not sort of either or, it's, a, it's, it's, it's both, right? So there's, you're gonna be, depending on the unit in the class, you're gonna be talking, you're gonna be at some, at some in some instances, sort of just talking about the fundamentals of how a system works. But then the reason we're talking about these systems is because they impact us and they impact people in societies. And so you can draw in examples of different impacts. And so, and, you know, we talk about 
air pollution, basically environmental justice of air pollution exposure and how there's, you know, this body of research showing that, if, you know, certain groups are exposed to more air pollution than others. And the Flint water crisis is another example. And so there's, there, you can kind of draw in these different examples um, throughout the class. And that class is particularly well suited to it for sure. Um, but that's one example. Great. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say, um, I, I love hearing that. That's, that's fabulous. Um, I mean, I, I did geology and geochemistry and most of, um, I think out of undergrad, most of the recruits were from the defense department or the oil industry and um, in terms of job placements after. And um, when we're talking about climate justice and climate change, if there isn't a conversation with geology and geophysics students, about um, you know the political economy around that, at least one class in the whole semester that sort of at least introduces them to um, you know who's on that land, um, the history of that, and the repercussions of some of these. Especially, they're you know I don't know they're going to be entering a different uh, a different world um, in terms of climate change. It's not the same. So, can I go, Kelly? Oh yes, please. Sorry, I didn't realize your hand was. Um, I just wanted to say I'm working with this urge, undoing racism in the geosciences pod two. Even though I'm retired, it's been really um, very educational, but your remarks really remind me of one of the things that was said, I think in our last sessions, they do a great big interview. This is involving thousands of people across the country actually in different departments, but then you work with your own local, your own department on these assignments that they give us. But one of the things that they were really saying about one piece of getting more um, BIPOC people into our field is uh, us academics opening our minds, the idea that some of these students are going to want to work on EJ issues. I mean, that would be what would compel them to be excited about this field. So I really think, um, although a lot of academic scientists are want to be really careful about not crossing into too far into politics or policies, I do think that we certainly need to be mindful that, there, that to appeal to a more diverse pool of people, we need to acknowledge that it's really important that we're training people who want to work for their communities in this way. That's great. And it, it, it could also be if people are hesitant about the edging into politics, you can have guest speakers, but also I would say it's this like orientation of um, market and sort of natural resource use. I don't know. I'm just, I just started reading that book, Talking Rocks, that I'm sure many of you have read already. It's this Minnesota geologist um, and an indigenous elder talking about the history of Minnesota geology together. So it's super interesting because in terms of just the worldview that how we teach geology and the compartmentalization versus the narratives and storytelling and what type of knowledge um, and maybe, you know, working also in collaboration with some traditional, um, traditional knowledge um, programs like in Col University of Colorado Boulder I think has a strong one, um, you all might know, but in terms of thinking about earth sciences and how to maybe bring that in. Um, so it's not necessarily about politics, but about um, thinking about, you know, spheres of knowledge and, um, and, and how, to, how, how to really think about um, expertise and community knowledge and not hold it as something less, but um, as something uh, to give your students the skills to understand this complexity. 
I had a quick question, if that's okay. Um, I was wondering how in, in your career or in your time working with uh, environmental justice, how, how do you think is, what is, what is the best way to approach a community that has been marginalized to come to the table and participate when they feel they have been marginalized and they may not be as willing to participate or to share their ideas. Um, how do you approach that situation? Um, yeah, that's a tough one. That it's um, a lot of it's about just like trust building, which is which is really hard. Um, and um, I think acknowledging the work the community's already been doing on this for a long time. I think there's you know, a view that um, like policy spaces and academics kind of swoop in. Um, but I would say if it's a community or culture that you're already maybe familiar with, um, so you kind of know um, some of the, the ways of working or organizations that you build trust with over time, um, you know, if you're all, if you're based in Minneapolis, I don't know if the research is, but there's many organizations that need research help. Um, uh, but it has to be what they want to research. And so it also depends kind of who's setting the, the research question and agenda. And so I think there's a lot of really deep structural questions when it comes to, um, academia and, you know, how that bridge happens. Um, I would say, but there've been a lot of successful partnerships, right? Um, at the U, I think um, Cura historically was trying to address this issue in terms of how to work in collaboration. Um, and I mean, the, the ones I found were, it's, it hasn't been institution-wide or it's really individual researchers that have come it would be great if it was more thoughtful structurally in terms of how academia can be more applied and sort of have an arm that is focused on where they are based. Um, I haven't, I've mostly seen individual researchers that have really just committed to showing up to community meetings for a long time to hear and listen, um, help at first, you know, answer the questions that community already has, help them with their research problems. And maybe then over time, it can evolve to a partnership, which I would say if it is a university led effort, then um, MOUs are really helpful. There's tools in place to sort of help build that trust faster. So you can also use those. Um, there's MOUs. I know there's been some really great collaborations I think uh, in New Mexico, there's some really good examples um, working with scientists, but there, there've been, and the Union of Concerned Scientists around, um, but there've been established MOUs in terms of who gets to communicate the findings, what training the community members get on the research after it's done. Um, so it doesn't just disappear into an academic journal um, and um, who gets to talk about it and frame it and um, who gets to, uh, and sort of agreement from a lot of the academic professionals that if they're called to like testify on things or whatnot, that there's, you know, conversation with the community and they're lifting up, they're using their platform to lift it up. Um, but there's a lot of power dynamics within academia. I know that you all know much better than I do. I think that's what I'm hoping this conversation sparks is your ongoing conversations internally in terms of how because you know your space is best, how you can, you know, um, what supports you all need internally to make, to be able to do that for community, right? Because it's not rewarded. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think that's a good point that you mentioned about how the those building of those partnerships is not really rewarded. And we, we talked a bit about that last semester um, in a seminar about building partnership, building community partnerships. And 
you know, there's kind of this disconnect between academic research that kind of runs on a three-year funding cycle and building those those partnerships is such such a, a long a long-term game, right? So, the, um, figuring out a mechanism to to keep those going is definitely needs to be a priority. Yeah, um, I can just sort of end with, um, you know, I got into geology because actually of a very sense of spiritual connection to the earth. And um, it was amazing what I learned, um, but it almost erased that part of me. And it wasn't until later that I came back to it, mostly through the narratives and storytelling of the, um, uh, of the Dakota people and really um, understanding where I was and thinking about it in different ways again and going back to my own roots around it. Um, and so I, um, I have a great love for the geophysical sciences as I know you all do. And um, I think, you know, um, I'm just excited for how the field can really shift and change to, um, to kind of hold these larger things and larger concepts that are so necessary. Absolutely. Are there any final thoughts, questions? We've got about a minute left. I'll just say uh, thank you for coming to the department to uh, speak to us on department head. And um, I have to say, we do struggle with a lot of these issues. And that's the why reason that we, we invited you. So thank you for doing that. And, um, you know, we do have some, as Dylan said, we do have some courses that we're trying our best, but I guess just one final question in a ideal world, how, how do you see this going forward um, in the future for departments like this? Um, what, what would, what do you, what would you, what would you suggest? <laughs> yeah, I think um, having, you know, if having conversations about land ownerships and it doesn't have to be political, but the sort of the socioeconomic history um, of what you're studying is important. And I think um, to like to value and um, promote uh, people getting out into the community, you know, that it's um, what are the structural changes needed so that people aren't penalized for doing it or takes away from their research, but it's actually part of the incentive structure um, to teach these things and to do research on them um, and to, to actually make a shift um, on, you know, it, I think about it in terms of spheres of influence, right? Racial justice, climate justice, these are huge, huge issues, but everyone needs to be working in their sphere of influence, right? And so this is your all sphere of influence. So there is, there is a role to play. And I think it's just, it's delving into those structural barriers. Um, so it's not just spot by spot or based on one professor's passion for it, um, where they have to fight battles. Cause I'm sure they do. Cause that, you know, we see that with a lot of, uh, a lot of times when people have to talk about race. So um, yeah, I'm just excited you all are starting, starting on this, so. Yeah, I hope that maybe some funding opportunities, things like that will help as well, because that, that kind of directs where we go in many cases. Anyway, thank you very much. I think we're over time, but I just wanted to especially thank you for coming. Great. Well, thank you all so much. It was wonderful to meet you. Reach out anytime. Perfect. Take care. Yes, you too. Thank you, Shalani. Thank you all for being here.